This convening is an effort to collectively capture our shared learning, exchange perspectives, and build a space for, uh, for our work. It's also an opportunity to present to you one of the, uh, some of the findings we have in our innovative evidence to policy work with Tafiti Sera. So just briefly, I know you all know what Tafiti Sera is, but it is a, a research policy community trying to establish communities of practice to engender evidence-informed decision-making. And uh, it comes as a result of many productive currents throughout the, the tenure of PASGA, but also that's also influenced by the many commitments of PASGA staff. Over the past several decades, African governments have uh, pursued various forms of uh, reform, and they've pursued various new interventions, all with the intention of speeding up transformation and are pursuing growth and development. Even though these were laudable schemes, very often there was no evidence that they would work before we, we undertook them. I'm very happy to say that uh, in the last few years, there has been a significant growth in the number of uh, researches being undertaken throughout Africa, from the south to the north, from the east to the west. We've seen young African researchers from different social science disciplines doing good research, using very, very well collected data. I am very happy that uh, uh, a body like PASGA exists to make it easier for policymakers to gain access to such new evidence. PASGA was created 10 years ago as to provide a voice for African social scientists to help them in doing the right type of research and provide a means for them to articulate their findings through evidence that could be used by governments in different countries. Therefore, we are very pleased to be able to support this convening, which gives us all the great opportunity for exchange and learning on policy, on evidence in front policy making terrain over the next two days. So my view, for instance, as Africa's main transformation agenda, in my interpretation, would be we have commitment to the SDGs, for instance. One of the things we'll ask ourselves is their targets, or at least some suggested targets. Where are we and what kind of ideas do we bring in to make sure that that gap is closed? So one of those is just basically a measurement. This is how far we are. Uh, this is how our peers are doing. And our view is then to communicate to whoever makes those decisions through that evidence that this is the gap we need to close. So once that is accepted, then we go into the fact that what are the tools, what are the methods, what are some of the ways in which we can work, and what are the resources that are needed to close that gap. It's important to have an inventory of what those policy opportunities are. For example, uh, under the SDGs, 20 African states are coming up for review in July of this year. So here's an opportunity for 20 states, uh, academics certainly, and civil society in particular. I think the major challenge that we have as a continent is the ability to dialogue meaningfully and honestly. I think in most cases, it's very difficult for people with the competing views to sit around a table and discuss issues in the interest of the broader common good. It's rare that that transformation starts without champion, without at least one champion. The second thing I would say is institutionalization, because I don't think the transformation is sustainable if it's not institutionalized through, particularly through policy making and decision making rules, whether they're in the executive or in the parliament, which of course then affects the incentives for the decision makers in terms of those institutionalized rules. We will find the evidence give it to the politicians, and they decide to shine it. 
So I was trying to think, can't we organize such kind of forums where we bring in the politicians themselves deliberately so that they listen to some of these things that are coming through so that they can appreciate the importance of evidence. This, this important forum which brings together practitioners, researchers, scientists, activists and the government together is uh, remarkable as far as the prospects of outcomes that could lead to a better understanding of uh, the importance of research with respect to education and in particular technical vocational training. As researchers conduct research, aimed at addressing the needs of the people, they ought to recognize that governments want to solve their problems and require practical, concrete, and applicable evidence. It is therefore critical that researchers identify the most innovative ways to overcome demand and supply side barriers, to evidence use and work closely with governments in particular as the recognized voices of the people to meet the needs of the electorate. So there's a recognition of the power of youth. There's a recognition that demographically, you know, a very large chunk of our population is going to be 15 or under in a matter of less than two decades. Um, but we still don't have strategies to make sure that we have rhetorical strategies at the level of the AU, talking about youth and Africa Youth Day and all of these sorts of things. And you always find people of a certain age uh, represented in these sorts of forums because they say we've got our youth here. Sometimes they're required to come on stage and perform and so on. But um, <clears throat> we have yet to kind of really figure out, you know, concretely how to engage people of a certain age uh, and of a certain trajectory in these discussions. And if we're talking about technology being a, you know, a, a future in the ways in which we engage with policy, then what you're really saying is that the future is youth or that it's youth that are engaging in these spaces because it is youth that are the most tech savvy segment of every population. It is youth that is spearheading these processes on big data, analyzing these, you know, going online um, and analyzing evidence in a way. So to say that they're not involved, I think, um, is misunderstanding. Um, and it's not true. And I think what we need to ask ourselves is what, you know, why aren't their voices being heard? We're talking about policy making vis-a-vis -vis issues of governance and anti-corruption. The experience is, after an election, you have between 18 and 24 months when the, recep the, recep recep the reception of policy makers to data around these issues is very high. If you want to move, move big things, make big decisions, you, that's the window. Once 24 months are over, um, they have settled, and then once they're into the third year, actually the next election cycle has already started. It has reached a point that a lot of data is collected from us, um, passively, but it's very accurate. There is a lot of data that we can analyze um, we can, even if we went to the Ministry of Land, uh, there is so much data there which, which, which has been digitized, which we can find from. But uh, I think we focus on areas that don't help us. We need to focus areas that would help us to shape policy. One thing we realize that evidence is multi-vocal, multiple voice situation. So there is something that experts have to say, there is something that the um, activists have to say, and also some impressions that all actors have to say. So this multi-vocality is a very important component in engaging evidence and is one of the things we learn also in our house. We also need to be responsive and timely with this responsiveness. Um, with the trends that are increasingly changing, both internally for our methods and our processes, but also the environment around us. And so if I think about a lot of the technology that is changing, 
there is a lot that is available to us and that is growing every day. Incorporating this not only in our application of work, but also in our thought processes is very, very important. Many of us uh, are scared of technology, but I think as we go forward and as we think about innovative ways, there is no way we're going to run from this. So we need to think about how we can actually incorporate it in how we think, but also how we work. And I'm wondering like, what kind of role psychologists can play in helping us kind of disseminate evidence in a better way to kind of strengthen that exchange, to really tap into the minds of people so that evidence, because evidence can be there, but it doesn't mean that it will be accepted. And I'm sure psychologists can play a big role in helping us kind of, um, I guess, communicate it in a way that is acceptable to people, especially if evidence kind of conflicts with cultural areas or on topics where, that are very, very controversial and culturally sensitive. But it's also true that the amount of data that has been gathered through research processes in the continent is increasingly uh, becoming huge enough to warrant a discussion of what we're doing with the FIT Sera. The fact that we recognize that a lot of primary research has already been done and therefore there's need to move towards synthesizing that evidence to formats that are, can actually then inform uh, policy discussions. We started uh, digitizing records in Kenya and most people didn't see how they would relate to what they are trying to build at the moment. Um, like we went ahead, did the national spatial data infrastructure. We also asked the government to free up the data. It was freed. You can get it online. It's World Poverty Clock. Uh, we've been working on this for the past five years. We are using both satellites, uh, machine learning. So we have done like 4,000 items. Uh, we can differentiate a goat from a cow or a cow from a human being. And possibly in the next few years, we can say how many, how many Kenyans woke up and came outside. The African Institute for Development Policy, we've started a project where we are collaborating with the African Academy of Sciences. Um, the project is called Evidence Leaders in Africa. Uh, what it strives to do is really target uh, scientists, researchers within the AAS community and to really move them to uh, working in the policy space. So the research they are doing beyond packaging it for science, for example, in peer-reviewed journals, and beyond packaging it for communications, they also get engaged with the policy makers, with the policy process. Universities need to take their think tank role more seriously than they are doing. A lot of African universities, how do they engage with government? But more critically, universities need to start training their own staff on evidence-informed decision-making on how they can engage more with government and even start having courses within universities themselves on evidence-informed decision-making, which is very different from training on research, as many of you know. I hope we can build a network going beyond this in which we continue to share, we continue to learn from each other, and we remain a community that in our different countries and different contexts, and that's an, another important thing, work in many ways to create an evidence-informed policy culture. But there's no one way of doing it. So it's always a pleasure being around you guys. I learn, I learn so much from you. Thank you very much. <laughs>